It's good to see everybody today. Last week of January in 2021, where has this year gone? <laughs> Last week, we talked about how Jesus uses parables to teach us. And I made a really bad joke about how he uses two male cows, parables. Okay, fine. Someone else out there has a sense of humor. You know how I know? They sent me this. Bob, what are you doing? Well, Jesus said he needed to teach us with parables. So someone out there has a sense of humor. It's Ben Chambers. He and I have been making each other laugh for decades now. But a parable is a fictional earthly story that's used to demonstrate a heavenly or a spiritual principle. And last week we talked about one of the first ones that Jesus told. And we talked about what's known as the parable of the sower. And I immediately started out by saying, that's a lousy title. Because it has nothing to do really with the sower. What it really is, is the parable of the four soils. And we can read it in Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 3. It says, Jesus told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen. Have you ever had to remind somebody to listen? What I'm going to say makes a difference. Pay attention. That's what Jesus is telling us. Every parent in this room has said the same thing. Because every one of us has been told something by a person and we weren't listening. And what they told us didn't benefit us. Jesus says, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath. The birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on the shallow soil with underlying rocks. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among the thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. There, the parable of the four soils. And we talked about it in some detail last week. We talked about how Jesus didn't use parables to make stories easy for everyone to understand. The parables that Jesus told meant different things on different levels. I'm assuming that there were people standing there on the edge of the lake listening to Jesus and their reaction was, well, yeah, sure. That's what happens when you throw seed around. And they didn't get at all what Jesus was talking about because all of Jesus' parables had to do with his kingdom, the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 13, going on to verse 10, it says the disciples came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? Well, Jesus replied, those who listen to my teaching and understand will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. Last week, we talked about how we have an abundance of information, but very little knowledge. We can find all sorts of information, but that doesn't mean we understand anything. There's a difference. Information is just sitting there. Knowledge, sometimes called wisdom, is knowing what to do with that information. 
Jesus wants us to have the understanding. He says, those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That's why I use these parables. The people look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. So that's why he tells parables. There's information for people. There is enticing concepts that if you think about, if you really listen to what Jesus is saying, if you take them home and unpack them a little bit, you'll realize he's teaching us important things. But not everybody gets it. Then we talked about what the story really meant. Jesus explained it to his disciples like this, starting in verse 18. The parable of the soils. He says, listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those (laughs) who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Nope, that's the next one. I skipped a paragraph, I'm sorry. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. Hard packed soil. There's nowhere for the seed to go. And so the soil get, or the seeds get taken. They don't benefit anybody except the birds who take the seeds. He says the next one. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message, immediately receive it with joy, but they don't have deep roots. They don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's words. Now, I've read many times that if you're ever out gardening and you want to know whether or not what you're trying to pull is a weed or a plant, if it's hard to get out, it's a weed. If it comes out accidentally, it's probably a plant. Now, that's, that's a joke, but there are people, gosh, I hate to say this, but we all know shallow people. We all know folks who really don't spend a lot of time putting down roots. It's the roots that enable the plant to survive. I read once that a redwood tree can spread its roots out over 12 to 15 acres. Have you ever wondered why some of those trees are two and 3,000 years old? And they can last through brutal storms and forest fires? Well, they've got good roots. Trees that don't have good roots, yeah, they're like the pepper tree that's in our front yard. 11 years ago this month, we had a very strong windstorm and I got up one morning and looked out and this nice big tree that we paid $1,200 for was lying down in the yard. It got broken off. It wasn't strong enough to withstand the storm. So a couple days later, a gentleman was going through the neighborhood looking for damage, and he offered to cut up the tree and take it away for, I think it was 120 bucks. And I said, sure. So he cut up the tree, took all the wood away, and I just left a little stump there. A few years later, I noticed that the little stump had grown quite a bit. Nowadays, the tree is actually taller than it was when it got blown down. And I've watched it every time we've had a really good windstorm. It doesn't bend over as much. The roots are still there and they're expanding. And it's a stronger tree. Does that mean that it can't be hurt? No. But it takes more and more to hurt it. 
Jesus told us about shallow soil. Then he said the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and so no fruit is produced. That's the problem with weeds, is they grow and they take the nutrients and they take the sunlight that we would rather the plants get. And the weeds choke out the plants. I've had that happen in my yards over the years. I didn't keep an eye on the weeds until all of a sudden I realized they were choking out the plants. Well, we let that happen in our lives all the time. We let the worry about things that are going on in this world become more important to us than God's kingdom. We've been talking about that a lot recently. We let the struggles that we're going through or the things that concern us or our desire to advance and prosper become more important to us than the kingdom of God. There's nothing wrong with wealth, folks. But the minute it becomes your goal, you're in trouble. The Bible's pretty clear that God blesses his people. But God doesn't spend a lot of time helping his people who are trying to get rich. We're specifically told not to think about that stuff. Why do you worry about what you're going to wear, where you're going to live, how much you're going to eat? We're not supposed to think about that. Oh, but that's our dream house. The fact that you've got a dream house means your priorities are wrong. According to Jesus, our dream house is supposed to be in heaven. And the one that he's building us is probably better than the one we want to build anyway. Thorny soil. Finally, Jesus told us about the seed that fell on good soil. It represents those who hear and understand God's word. And it produces a harvest 30, 60, even a hundred times as great as what has been planted. So we talked about all this last week. We talked about how there's nothing you and I can do to improve the job of the farmer. You and I cannot help the farmer do a better job. Why? The farmer is God. He is the sower of the seeds. You and I can't help him. But let me put it a little differently. He doesn't need my help. He knows what he's doing. He's done it before. And he's been successful at it. We can't do anything to improve the seed because the seed is God's word. I don't want to ask because someone may raise their hand, but is there anybody in here who can improve on God's word? No. The only thing we can have an effect on, the only thing that we can actually impact is the condition of the soil in our hearts. That's it. And what type of soil is in our heart is our choice. Now, how do I know we're talking about our hearts? Well, we read in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. It says, God's word is alive and working and is sharper than a double-edged sword. It cuts all the way into us where the soul and the spirit are joined to the center of our joints and bones. It judges the thoughts and feelings in our hearts. Our hearts are the soil that Jesus is talking about. Now, if you're standing on the side of the lake trying to keep your kids from getting in a fight and you're not really paying attention to what Jesus is saying, you might not get this. But this is what Jesus is talking about. He's telling his followers, you pay attention to the condition of your heart. 
There's nothing wrong with God as the sower. There's nothing wrong with God's word as the seed. And if you want a 30 or a 60 or a 100 times increase in what God has given us in his word, we've got to pay attention to the condition of our hearts. The common English version says it this way. What God has said isn't only alive, it isn't only active, it's sharper than any double-edged sword. His word can cut through our joints or our spirits and our souls, through our joints and marrow until it discovers the desires and thoughts of our hearts. The word of God tells us (laughs) what the desires and thoughts of our hearts are because of how we react to it. When things go away that we don't want them to go, how do we react? Do we panic? Let me just suggest that if we panic, it's because the word of God is not in our hearts regarding his safety, his plans, and his provisions. Do we put all the hope that we have for a successful and prosperous future in political leaders? If so, it's because our hearts aren't trusting in our Heavenly Father. I had a really interesting conversation with the guy this week on how one of the worst things that we can be called in our culture, is apathetic. You just don't care. Now see, I short circuit that because a lot of times I'll say, you're right, I don't care. But, but how can you not care about this little fish in Borneo? Sorry, what's it taste like? <laughs> I don't care. Well, that's just apathy and apathy's wrong. Could be. I'm really trying to focus on caring about the things that I can actually influence. I really am trying to focus on caring about the things where I can make a difference. And then we were talking about how This is not new because we just read this a few weeks ago. What was it the apostles, the disciples said to Jesus when they were on the boat and the storm came up? Don't you even care? And Jesus looked at them and said, I was sleeping, dude. All of a sudden, it occurred to me, not caring puts me in pretty good company. Because there's a lot of stuff in our world that I can't change. Well, maybe that's because it's not my problem. Oh gosh, if you want to get people upset at you, just tell them it's not your problem. I was watching a show a couple of years ago, one of those you know, very intellectually stimulating car repair shows. <laughs> and the boss walks in and he was looking at this and they were describing an issue to him and he goes, you know, I can really see that that's a problem. It's not my problem. <laughs> and turned around and walked away. And I thought, ooh, I like that. Rhonda was just talking about what, what if it's not our problem? What if it's God's problem? What if God's just waiting for us to give it back to him? The word of God tells us the desires and the thoughts of our hearts. So, as we're reading through these stories, there are three things that Jesus says we need to have. And I want to ask that we have these. I want to have eyes to see. 
Not only do I want to see what's going on, I want to see what God wants me to see. There is so much in Scripture that tells me what to focus on that gives me the impression that it is my choice. I want to have eyes to see what God is showing me. I want to have ears to hear what God is telling me. You know, there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of noise out there. Have you ever been someplace that was quiet and it got creepy? (laughs) There are times when we'd be up in the mountains and we'd be walking around at night or something and all of a sudden we'd just stop and listen. And it's weird because there's no sirens, there's no helicopters, there's no motorcycles, there's no cars. They're just animals. And they're not making much noise. I need to learn how to ignore the noise surrounding me and focus on what God wants me to hear. And finally, I want a heart to understand. I want to just not see and not hear. I want to understand what God is showing and telling me. Because he's got a reason to show me that stuff. So the question is, how can we make sure that our hearts, our soil, is fertile and ready to produce a crop of God's word? A lot of folks try really hard to look good to those around them. After all, come on, Charles, what's the point of having good soil if you can't show everybody else how good your soil is? (laughs) Give somebody a couple weeks, they'll come up with a Christian t-shirt that says in big letters on the back, good soil! (laughs) And then the next version would come out, And it'd say, I've got good soil, how about you? And then the next version would come out that says, don't you wish your soil was as good as mine? I've been around churches a long time. We like people to see that we have good soil. We like it when other people think we're really spiritual and important to God. It's one of the reasons I think it's funny. I know a lot of church folks that have a hard time speaking in English. You notice that there are words that only church folks use, right? When you ask somebody, well, how are you doing this week? And they say, it's a good week. We all know what that means. But Margie, if you ask somebody, how are you doing this week? And they say, blessed. There's a part of me that goes, oh, come on. And then they'll take it, too blessed to be stressed, brother. (laughs) And I'm like, dude, I know you. We like to make people think that we're really spiritually on the ball. In fact, we'll focus on how we look to other folks to make sure that they know how good we're doing. There were folks like this around when Jesus was on earth too. It's a funny thing. He didn't seem to be fooled by them. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 12, Jesus said, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. When we try and make ourselves look good, when we try and make ourselves look important, Jesus says that we will be humbled. Does anybody here know what it feels like to be humbled? I do. 
It's not a pleasant experience. I can remember as a kid sitting in class and the teacher would ask a question. And I go, I know this one. This is easy. And then I'd get it wrong. And people would laugh. I just exalted myself and was humbled. A few verses later, the message says it this way. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, by the way, who were the most spiritually on the ball people in his culture. And they were better than everyone else and everyone else knew it because the Pharisees told them so. Jesus looks at them. Have you ever wondered why somebody could be upset with Jesus? Just follow along here. He says, you're hopeless, you religious scholars and Pharisees. Frauds! You're like manicured grave plots. Grass clipped, the flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotting bones and worm eaten flesh. People look at you and think you're saints, but beneath the skin, you're total frauds. Jesus could have taken some interpersonal classes. That is not out of how to win friends and influence people. But Jesus was not particularly impressed with how we like to make ourselves look good. He knew that that was not where the important stuff was. The apostle Peter talks about this in his first letter, chapter five and verse six. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. It is not fun to be humbled. But when we humble ourselves, when we choose to put ourselves lower, it's not humiliating at all. And Peter says, God will lift you up in honor. My guess is that at some point in time, every one of you has been complimented by somebody whose opinion matters. And man, it feels good to not be the one who's going, hey, everybody, look at me. Look at me, look at me, look at me. But instead to have somebody say, look at them. Can you imagine what it would feel like when God says, look at my kid. because of the way things have been for the last year and they're not changing very quickly, we haven't had a good science fair around here in quite a while. And I always love science fairs. As a kid, I loved the adrenaline rush of coming home the day before and saying, <laughs> we've got a science project to do. And then my mom going, nope, I've got to work. And she walks out. And my dad gets stuck helping me come up with an idea. And then I got to work in the education field. And I loved watching kids do their science projects. And I loved the science fair on Thursday night. And we come and we look at all the projects. And I can see the kids who did these projects just standing there so happy with their work and their effort. And I've seen the parents who did the other projects going, you gave me a B, I mean, my kid a B? <laughs> One group is trying to exalt themselves. The other group is enjoying the fact that the teacher is exalting them. 
Can you imagine what it feels like when God says, yeah, but look at my kid. Just like everything else, he will do so much better a job at lifting us up than we can possibly do lifting ourselves up. Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. So, all of this is very positive until right about now. And some of us start having these uncomfortable thoughts. What happens if, what happens when I mess up? What happens when God wants me to do something with him and I mess it up? I'd like to say if, but I know myself. It's when. There's a part of me that would say, you know, I'm not sure because I personally haven't made any mistakes. In my notes, it just says, wait, why are you laughing? (laughs) Because I knew Charles was going to be here. I have laughed at the irony over the years of God putting a guy with a sense of humor like mine and a vocabulary like mine on the platform in a church. This very morning before church, I was standing up here talking to a friend of mine and he used a very crude phrase. And I said, great. Now I'm gonna have to focus the whole time I'm up there on not saying that phrase. (laughs) Because I thought it was pretty funny. I know I mess things up. The question I have is, what happens? Does God ever regret choosing me? Does God ever change his mind? Does God ever look over and smack Jesus on the side of the head and say, why did you bring him? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9, and this is the Apostle Paul quoting from Deuteronomy 25. Paul says, The law of Moses says you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Was God thinking only about oxen when he said this? And you might think that is the least spiritual verse Pastor Mike has ever read in church. Because I'm talking about ox. Now the context here is Paul's saying that it makes perfect sense for churches to support the ministers that lead them. And he's saying even in the Old Testament, what kind of a fool would keep the animals from eating who are the ones doing the work? But because I have an inappropriate and irreverent sense of humor, I alluded to this last week. I know what happens to animals when they eat. I was a kid with dogs. I know what dogs do. at inappropriate times and inappropriate places. I know what it feels like to run barefoot across the backyard. There are 
are certain things you don't want to feel squeezed between your toes. <laughs> because if an animal eats, every one of us eats and there's part of what we have taken in that needs to be expelled. Now, I'm trying to be very vague. Um, if you don't think that's the case, just remind yourself what it felt like the last time when that part of your body wasn't working. One of the worst feelings. And you'll see commercials about this on TV about how horrible it is to be constipated. Because we all take in things that need to be expelled. And on the one hand, you think, well, that sure wasn't very creative of God. And on the other hand, I'm thinking, wait a minute, God's system is perfect. What does the soil need to produce the crop that's been planted there? What comes out of the back of the animal after the animal has eaten the crop that's been planted there? It's the circle of life. <laughs> now Paul says, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Well, the ox is also going to poop. We're talking about spiritual manure here. This is where my friend used a phrase that's not appropriate. He said, you mean holy, yeah. <laughs> We're gonna do that. Every once in a while, I'm gonna be responsible for a spiritual load of poop. <laughs> Every once in a while, you are going to be responsible for spiritual poop. And on the one hand, we don't like how that makes us look to other people. Because I guess we think not everyone poops. We were having a board meeting years and years and years ago, and we were trying to figure out some ways to see if we could raise money. And as I tend to do, I made an inappropriate joke. And I said, you know, if we could come up with a list of all the important people in the church that have used the toilet right there in the hospitality room, Wonder what we could get on eBay for it. After all, who's used that toilet? Well, Phil Driscoll has, Oral Roberts has, Richard Roberts has, Kenneth Hagen has, Jerry Savelle has. This endless list of very spiritual butts have been on that toilet. <laughs> you know why? Because everyone poops. There may be somebody in here who thinks, you know what my house needs? It needs a toilet that Pastor Ron has sat on for 40 years. Every one of us does. And for some reason, we think that that's a problem. Can it be? Yes. There's not a person in this room who does not have an embarrassing story about that particular subject. I know some of those stories and I'm keeping my mouth shut because the people about whom I know those stories know my stories. 
And they will get great joy talking about a trip I was driving the bus home from Solvang with the youth group when my stomach let me know that things were not okay. Let me just say, I often feel sorry for the Caltrans worker that found those pants. Those stories can be embarrassing. We wish they didn't happen, but they happen to all of us. Paul tells us in Romans chapter eight and verse 28, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. It doesn't mean everything that happens is good. It's just God uses it for good. He can take bad stuff and work it around to where it works out for good. He can use stuff that we really wish no one knew about. When stuff happens that we wish no one knew about, doesn't God ever admit his mistakes, remove the gifts and talents and blessings that he's given us? Remove the job that he's given us? Well, again, Paul tells us this. In Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, Paul says, for God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Now, the Amplified Version says it in a few more words. <laughs> for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. He does not withdraw what he has given, nor does he change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. I believe the common English version says, God never changes his mind about the people he calls. He never decides to take back the blessings he has given them. So when we have to deal with spiritual manure sometimes, what we don't have to worry about is God regretting what he's done and taking things back from us. The Bible says he will never revoke his call. He will never take back the blessings that he's given us. Never is a big word. Have you ever wondered how people who are just not nice people can also be so gifted and talented? It doesn't make sense. How can somebody who's such a jerk also be such a great singer? How can someone who is so despicable be such a fantastic artist? How can someone who isn't nice be so smart? You know how? God doesn't take back the blessings he's given people. So what you're saying is how we behave doesn't matter? No, never said that. There are very, very gifted people that I know. But because of their character, I've had to distance myself from them. I've watched people who were incredibly gifted, called into ministry, who have lost their ability to influence people because they were jerks. Because they couldn't keep things in their own family. Because they decided to get involved in relationships that they were not supposed to be in. We've all seen this over and over and over again. But the thing is, 
Their call hasn't changed and their gifts haven't changed. Just their ability to use that call and those gifts has changed because of how they've behaved. Do you remember what we learned from the story of Joseph way back in the book of Genesis at the beginning of the Bible? In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he said, it is true that you plan to do something bad to me. He's talking to his brothers. Did they plan to do something bad to him? Well, yeah, they wanted to kill him. And then one of his brothers said, yeah, maybe we shouldn't kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. We'll let the guy that buys him kill him. Yeah, his brothers had plans to do something bad to him. But really, God was planning good things. God's plan was to use me to save the lives of many people, and that's what happened. My guess is that you've had things happen in your lives that you didn't like. You've had things happen in your lives because people actually tried to cause you harm. You've had things happen in your life that did not go the way they should have gone. Guess what? God still wants to use you to help people. There are things that have happened in my life that did not go the way I wanted them to go. There are things that have happened to me that were not right. There are things that have happened to me that were not right by good Christian people. And that shouldn't surprise me because I've done things that weren't right to people too. But none of that changes the fact that God wants to use you to help the people around you. Yeah, but what if I've got a whole lot more spiritual manure in my life than I need to? What does soil need to be fertile and ready to produce a harvest? We all take manure and we all mix it into soil. We'll go down to the store and buy it. <laughs> Hi there. I'd like a 40 pound bag of cow. Yeah. And it never seems to occur to any of us that we're spending good money on the stuff that comes out of the wrong side of a cow. but it's what it takes to have fertile soil. God is able to take the stuff in my life that I would rather wasn't there. And if my heart's okay, he can bring a 30, a 60, a hundredfold increase and help the people around me, help me. Oh man. The stuff that people meant for your harm, God will use for your good. The mistakes that we've made, God can still use that if we surrender it to him. And if at the end of all this, you're still thinking this doesn't make any sense. Find me one person in the Bible besides Jesus who didn't screw something up. Well, what about the Apostle Paul? He murdered Christians. Well, what about the Apostle Peter? He was a racist. God could use a racist? 
Yeah, he does all the time. Well, what about the Virgin Mary? She argued with Jesus. And she listened to what he said and blew it off. Jesus, you're at this wedding. They're running out of booze. Do something. And Jesus looks at her and says, woman, do you have any idea what would happen to me if I'd ever addressed my mother like that? He says, woman, this is not my time. Leave me alone. And she looked and said, don't listen to him. Just do what he says. The Bible's full of flawed people that God used anyway. God has such things planned for the soil in the hearts of the people at Bethel that we can't even imagine. We just can't lie to ourselves that we've been disqualified because of something we might have said or done or thought. Oh, spiritual manure. Let God use it to cultivate your soil. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Father, for, for, for a sermon that I know a lot of people never thought they'd hear because I never thought I'd give it. But Father, you are so real with us and there is nothing that we can do to surprise you. There's nothing we can do to change you. There's nothing we can do to help you do a better job. All we can do is let you love us and believe how much you love us. So Father, as you're speaking to everybody today, thank you for speaking clearly. Thank you for not withdrawing a calling for not removing gifts. Thank you for being you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.